Hi there, my name is Fran Torson. Francis Flynn Torson. I am a uh, creator of No Blogger Left Behind blog coaching program. I had my very first newspaper column at the age of 16 in northern New Jersey. I was a newspaper reporter in New Jersey, a magazine editor in Manhattan for 10 years, and I've written articles and books. I started blogging in January of 2005. I watch trends. Unfortunately, present trends in real estate do not reflect a high degree of knowledge or attention to intellectual property rights. I'm the creator of No Blogger Left Behind and the co-author of the Real Estate Social Media Policies and Procedures Manual, a 20-plus page document, and copywriting is a very small part of that, although not, an import, not unimportant, just a small part in terms of the, the amount of paragraphs. Um, I worked as a realtor in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania for 22 years before moving to Tucson in 2007. I am a blogger, I am a writer, and an editor. Please do not construe the information you receive today as legal advice. The best way to ask a question is to chat one in. You can see the chat right there. And, uh, and I would greatly appreciate your feedback following class. You don't have to include your name if you don't want to share. If you have legal questions, the best person to ask is an attorney. They're the best ones to answer questions about law. Now let's, ask, let's have a couple of uh, questions here. The first, uh, first commandment is thou shalt be able to define intellectual property and what that is. Now, what intellectual property could be protected by copyright? So let's, let's ask this question. What intellectual property could be protected by copyright? Number one, a speech you give off the top of your head, or number two, a computer program you created for your boss. Let's see, okay, I'll give you a couple of seconds here and we'll see how, how you folks weigh in and, and we'll check it out. All right, well, very, very good. A speech you give off the top of your head, exactly, is not in, in a tangible fixed form. A computer program is a creative work and would be able to have a copyright. Okay, so that's terrific. Hey listen, by the way, if you have a uh, if you have an employment contract with your employer or your broker, what, you know, what does that say about uh, ownership of property that, that you create? Think about that. Here's another one. A computer, okay, which of these actions would be legal? This is another question. Which of these actions would be legal? Number one, to allow a friend to use your photo of a landscape on her website. Or number two, ask a photo processor to make copies of your family portraits taken by a photo studio. Legal, okay, which is legal? Okay, one, all right. You own it, you own the photo, so you can share it. Number two, in most cases with photo portraits, you are not the copyright holder, okay? If you're working with a photo studio and you, and you don't have the copyright, you cannot make copies without permission. So, good job. Good job on both of those. Very, very good. Now we're going to talk about intellectual property rights. You know, realtors are used to talking about property rights, and today we're going to talk about a different type of property right than you're used to talking about. Intellectual property rights was first discussed back in the 19th century and it gained traction in the 20th century. Under intellectual property law, owners are granted exclusive rights to a variety of tangible, intangible assets, such as musical, literary, and artistic works, discoveries and inventions, and words, phrases, symbols, and designs. Now let's not forget that the word realtor is a trademarked name and protected under law. The Realtor logo also. The word Realtor is protected under trademark law, another type of intellectual property law. If you do not understand how to use the word Realtor correctly, take a little trip to Realtor.org for more information and be knowledgeable about the way to use a very important word in your business. Many people are using the word incorrectly and sometimes when you see something often enough it looks right even when it's wrong. There are different types of intellectual property and each type of property has different laws. Now think about this, okay, and in some ways it's just like real estate. <coughs> there are different types of real estate. Think about this. Residential single-family homes, residential multi-unit properties, commercial properties, industrial properties, land. Different laws and regulations govern the use of these properties. Laws govern tenancy, development, mineral rights below the land. Um, each type of real estate property has different laws attached to it, and there is a different type of expertise attached to each property type as a practitioner and as also as a legal person. Now, copyright 
is a type of law attached to intellectual property. Trademark, trademark is, an, is another type of law. Patent covers inventions and discoveries. Industrial design rights is another type of intellectual property. Um, the intellectual property umbrella uh, covers different types, and in some areas of the country, trade secrets are also covered as intellectual property. You see there are many, many different types of intellectual property law, just as there are many types of real estate, and it's important to understand them. Copyright is, is part of a bigger discussion of permission-based content management. That's what I like to call it. It's about the legal way, copyright is about the legal way to share intellectual property. As part of a risk management plan, assess the content on your website and blog. You know, what do you own? What do other people own there? If you're working with a templated website or blog, some of the content may belong to the website provider and you should know exactly what the boundaries of ownership are wherever you have a presence online. What's yours? What is not yours? We're going to talk about permission-based content management um, and, uh, you know, as part of an overall risk management strategy that prevents you from being sued. The cost of litigation are high, folks, even when you win a case in court. So copyright falls into the legal domain. It is in the province of the courts when there are disagreements about ownership. It's a legal issue. Fair use provides a way to use copyrighted materials without permission in certain cases. Fair use is not a law. Fair use is an interpretation of the copyright law, and we're going to talk about that in greater depth in a little while here, and we're going to use a real-life example in the real estate industry that, uh, that is something that I do personally. We're also going to talk about Creative Commons. Creative Commons is a licensing construct. Creative Commons is an avenue that lets you find intellectual property for your blog, lets you license your own intellectual property to share with other people. And then we're going to talk a little bit about, um, about public domain, but not a whole lot because we could spend another whole hour talking about this. Works are in the public domain if they're not covered by intellectual property rights at all. If the intellectual property rights have expired, or if the intellectual property rights are forfeited or unclaimed. So there, there are many sources of public domain content that are freely available, and I will be having a webinar covering public domain um, in the very, very near future. So to keep your eyes open uh, for that, especially if you're in No Blogger Left Behind, because I'm going to do that as, as part of uh, what I do over there. Okay, and, and understand, you know, understand as much as you can about copyright. Um, Copyright offers protection. Okay, copyright offers protection by the laws of the United States to the authors of original works of authorship, including literary, dramatic, musical, artistic, and such, you know, certain other intellectual works. It means the right to copy. It is an exclusive right. Um, only the author of a property has the exclusive right to copy and share it. Let me give you an example. Okay, I'm conducting this webinar. I'm creating the webinar. I have a PowerPoint I created for the webinar. I own the intellectual property because I created it. I alone have the right to copy and share it. Um, if I produce a webinar for somebody else, for another party, I give that party the right to share and distribute the property also. I've done, for instance, a, a webinar for CRS. When I do that for CRS, and CRS pays me and I give them the right to share and distribute the property from there. Um, in some cases, I conduct webinars and the intellectual property contained in the recording becomes a product that I share. Sometimes I offer the product in conjunction with somebody else and we share the income derived from the sale of video replays. All right? Unless you have permission to share this webinar, you're prohibited by law from sharing the link or sharing the download. Um, nobody has the right to share the video unless I grant them the right. So I, I'm not posting this video on YouTube. I'm sharing the video two ways. First, in an exclusive webinar replay that you'll have access to in another day or so, or, 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 or several hours when this is over. And second, as a premium content, this will be appear as premium content on No Blogger Left Behind. Now, there are minimum requirements for copyrights by law. All right, You can't just have a thought about something and copyright a thought. A copyright can only be applied to something that is original where you are the author. It must be a creative product and it must be in a fixed form. 
articles, written materials, photos, video, music plays, those are fixed forms. Um, a lot of what we create online meets these minimum requirements. Uh, the blog posts we write, the videos we produce, the podcasts we create. All of these are original, you know, or, you know, hopefully, or purchased. All are creative, fixed forms of intellectual property, and all of those and all are protected by copyright. All right, now, when, when exactly does copyright begin? Copyright begins the very moment an author puts an idea into tangible form. That's when the right to copy begins. The moment an idea is created with form, it's covered under the law. Intellectual property is conceived in the mind, it is born in tangible form. Copyright protection begins at the moment of birth. It's a good idea to give copyright notice. Use the copyright word or a symbol, or both. Include the year the content was born and the name of the author. Uh, copyright notice should look something like this. Now, most authors include this notice at the bottom of their blogs or websites. You don't have to put the notice on every single blog post. That's not necessary. One notice at the bottom of the page should suffice. Now, what, you know, why do we even have copyright? Well, we have copyright because our founding fathers, okay, the, you know, in the Constitution, um, talk about promoting creativity. They talked about promoting innovation and the spread of knowledge. The whole notion of copyright and the protection attached to it inspires people to create because they have less fear about losing their property. They have assurances they can exercise their rights as owners of the property they create. People are less afraid of sharing their creativity when they know protections are attached to them. They can work in a more risk-free environment knowing their property is safe and that they have legal recourse if somebody steals it. Copyright balances the rights of owners and end users. Owners of intellectual property can assert their rights to restrict use of their content. They can charge fees for the use of their content. They can limit how it is used. It gives property owners legal recourse. It is their property. They have a say in how it's used, how it's modified, how it's distributed. If someone steals your property, you can sue them. You can send them a cease and desist letter. You can put them on notice that the property is not theirs. It is not theirs for the taking. You can send them a letter and demand payment if you want. Uh, you know, I know, I know a pro popular speaker in the real estate industry who found a photo on Google, which is a no-no, by the way. You, you, hopefully you know that you can't do that. And she took this photo, she posted it on her blog, and received a letter from an attorney representing the person who owns the rights to the photo she used. She paid over $800 to settle out of court. She removed the photo from her blog and learned a very, very valuable lesson. Now, just because a photo appears in Google search does not mean you have the right to take it. Just because it is there does not mean you can use it. And as technology advances, it becomes easier for people to discover if other people are using their property and infringing upon their copyright. Technology makes it very easy for people to work online, to create intellectual property, to be able to share it and do all kinds of things with it. You can reproduce it. You can prepare derivative works of it, distribute copies, perform or display it publicly. Now let, let me tell you a little bit about derivative works, okay? Um, this is a very, very important phrase in the copyright arena. I have a book, I have a couple books actually, HUD, about HUD Homes for Sale. And I've got one, HUD Homes for Sale, uh, the Sales and Marketing Guide for Real Estate Agents. I repurposed that book into six hours of live training for a CE class in, here in Arizona. The class I created became a derivative of the book I wrote for real estate agents. I also repurposed the book into blog posts. I took chapters and topics within chapters and created individual blog posts, and those blog posts were derivatives of the book I wrote. I also published an online class about HUD Homes, and that's another derivative product of the book. If you have an ebook or intellectual property, you own the right to the derivative works originating in that intellectual property. An owner may authorize others to have these rights and also to sell the property. Um, also, the easier it gets to manage content, the easier it becomes to steal it. And that, that's just the way it goes, and, and we're seeing a lot of that. So that's one of the reasons this is such a timely discussion. Um, copyright law applies to articles written by other authors, photographs and images, 
uh, videos and music. Um, avoid really, really severe financial consequences that follow unauthorized use of another person's intellectual property. You know, I'm going to address the, the, the copyright violations I see most frequently in the real estate industry. I see lots of agents and brokers taking whole articles from online and posting them on their blogs. I see it happen with Wall Street Journal articles and, and articles from other newspapers and online magazines. And that's not the way to share information from other sources. The best way to take the essence of an article for your blog is to refer to the article title, take two or three sentences, and provide a link to the original source. I just read it, you know, something like this. Say, I, I just read a great article about foreclosures in the Wall Street Journal. Okay, put in the, the title, put in a couple of sentences, and a link back to the original article. Wholesale ripoffs of articles happens, happens a lot, and, and I'm surprised that, that real estate agents are still are not getting it about reprinting whole articles on their blogs. I, I don't understand. Um, maps is another area where there's a great deal of copyright infringement. People buy maps, you know, for, they buy designer maps, they buy map technology, and people just come from, from other places and just take them. They think that it's just, just because it's there, they can take it. Well, you can't take anyone else's maps any more than you can walk into a store and say, hey, that's a great steak, I'll take it home because I'm hungry. You have to pay for the steak before you walk out the door or you will be arrested for shoplifting. Intellectual property has parallels, real parallels, in the brick and mortar world. Now, honor, you know, you honor people who, who create content. Honor is something, you know, very, very important. And that's another area where I think that we have, uh, we have some major issues here. Um, this is the first part of a discussion, a very long discussion at LinkedIn. Uh, it was started and uh, initiated by Broderick Perkins. Broderick Perkins is a seasoned veteran journalist. He's been writing professionally for more than 30 years. And you've probably read his articles on Realty Times and on Home Away and other places. Broderick makes his money writing. Um, and, and he has a problem because he, you know, people are just stealing his work stripped off his byline and put stories on their blogs and and he you know came on to uh, LinkedIn at one point and said he's going to start to work with a copyright attorney to make an example of the people who does it and he said he was just fed up well the, dis the discussion that followed that was just amazing people tell him you know chiding him for wasting negative energy and doesn't doesn't everyone post this type of content on their website now of course they say I mean can you imagine I bet you can think of more than a couple times you use content from someone else's advertising to, to promote yourself. Can you imagine assuming that? Um, and, and, and it was just a just unbelievable discussion. Um, somebody else says, I agree with, it, with, uh, with this former person who just spoke. While it hurts when our intellectual property is stolen, the important thing is that you are responsible for sharing valuable information with your audience. Hey folks, these people are not getting it. Uh, you know, he has a legitimate complaint. His property is being stolen, and this is the type of attitude that we see in the real estate industry, you know, that's getting worse and worse and not better. And this is a trend that I see, and this is a trend that's going to put people at risk. It's going to put agents at risk, and it's going to put more brokers at risk because remember, brokers, you know, people who are working for you, uh, you know, are, 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 are supposed to be following the law and doing things right. And if they're not, you're going to go after the brokers because the brokers have the deep pockets. So I'm just telling you, you know, this is something that we're seeing. I see it as a trend and you need to watch out. Um, let's talk a little bit about fair use here because it's important to understand fair use. And fair use is not a law. Okay, fair use is an interpretation of the copyright law. Don't confuse it with public domain. Fair use applies to unauthorized use of another person's copyrighted material in a legal way. So there are ways where you can use somebody else's material and do it legally when those are, are, are applications that involve news reporting, research, and education. And then, of course, stuff has to be done in a, in a moderate fashion. So as I say, um, you know, I have some examples about this in my own life. Um, one of them is, uh, it, you know, dates back to a couple of years ago. I had a television show here in Tucson for a season. It was called Truth in Housing Matters. And every week I talked about foreclosures and, and I talked about the issues with the homeless. Um, I had an episode called Foreclosure Hall of Shame. And I wrote a series of blog posts about it on various platforms. I had blog posts on Trulia, Active Rain, Realtown, and, and also on my own blog. And, uh, and 
Two of the photographs in those blogs were taken without authorization and without permission from a web marketing company. Uh, the web marketing company had a webinar. I took a screenshot of one of their postcards from the webinar and I used it to illustrate my article. Um, it was an article about uh, a type of marketing to distressed homeowners that did not include information about and, and, and very, very strong recommendations to use attorneys or, or have housing counselors and it was all about getting the listings, getting the short sale listings, you know, when, and it was a very, very sales centric uh, type of marketing approach and I have a problem with that and I think that, uh, that, that there is a type of marketing that is selling the American homeowner down the river. That's not good, it's not responsible, I think it's reckless and I think it's a shame and I also think it's a shame that, uh, that so much of the real estate training about short sales is so short sighted that it doesn't, uh, doesn't address those issues. And I think that that's going to be another liability issue. It's not an intellectual property issue, but it will be another issue. At any rate, I had a couple of those photos. I, used, I took the same photo, and I also created a series of YouTube videos that I created for distressed homeowners in different market areas where real estate practitioners were subscribing to this particular service. So the copier, well, okay, so what are we saying about copyright here? Now, if I was using the image to create my own marketing materials because I was, you know, reaching out to those homeowners, then I would be guilty of copyright infringement. In this case, I was using the image to report and educate, and that's where the fair use comes in. This was in an article um, for, for real estate people and, uh, and for consumers to learn how to differentiate between, uh, you know, between compassionate outreach that really gave them a fair look at their options and what I call predatory marketing and this was something I call predatory marketing. Now the owners of the images made attempts to have my post removed at all of those platforms and obviously they were not happy with my perspective about predatory marketing. Their attempts to have those posts removed were unsuccessful because I was operating under fair use guidelines. And this is a very important distinction and heaven knows I am not the least bit interested in victimizing distressed homeowners. So that's, that's the last thing I have on my mind. Okay, more challenges about copyright. How about Twitter has, has some very, very special challenges relative to copyright enforcement. Um, Twitter has a 140 character limit that makes it next to impossible, not totally impossible, but almost very, very difficult, to post a work that reaches a standard for copyrightability, okay? Um, short, some works, you know, some short works can be protected by copyright. Haiku, for instance, very, very, very short work is protected by copyright. But most of the stuff posted to Twitter would likely be, you know, not be seen as um, original works of authorship, all right? They're simply too short and they don't usually read the, read the requisite level of creativity. Uh, that said, some tweets could be copyrighted if they met the description, and, and almost certainly a collection of tweets from the same person could be copyrightable if they could be seen as one large work broken over many entries. So Twitter, Twitter is an interesting, interesting phenomenon on many, many levels. Here we go. Number five, that shall not steal music. Boy, oh boy, and, uh, and this is something interesting because the music industry has suffered an incredible loss of revenue. Artists, musicians, writers, and publishers have all taken a hit, and the music industry is evolving to, to brand new business models. Um, at the same time, the industry is vigorously prosecuting people who violate the law, and I see real estate agents and vendors using popular music as background to their videos on YouTube and elsewhere. This is a very dangerous trend, not just for the agents, but for the real estate brokers as well. Remember, brokers have the deep pockets when it comes to being sued. If you have agents who are irresponsible in online publishing, you can be held accountable. Um, agent marketing comes under a broker's license jurisdiction and a broker shares the risk of being sued. The bigger the broker, the deeper the pockets, the more vigorous a prosecution is likely to be. Um, I, I know a really wonderful broker in the Southeast who spent $25,000 on legal fees just to stay out of court in an issue involving an agent, uh, in an issue involving an agent who wrote something when, when he was working at another broker. So he wasn't even working for her when he committed the, uh, you know, the, the, or wrote the blog post that, that somebody was suing about. Um, and, and it didn't matter. I mean, was it reckless blogging? Most probably it was. Uh, the, the person who sued said it damaged his business, it re damaged his reputation. And, uh, and interestingly, the matter was, was um, in a lawsuit that, that preceded the agent's relationship with the brokerage. Um, still, cost the broker $25,000 just to stay out of court. 
And the bottom line is being sued is expensive even when you've done absolutely nothing wrong. It can find you. Trouble can find you and it can get you even when you have done nothing wrong. Um, thou shalt honor Creative Commons. Now this is really, really neat. Creative Commons is a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful uh, uh, construct for sharing intellectual property. Cyber law and intellectual property experts got together at the turn of the last millennium and released its first set of copyright licenses for free to the public. So Creative Commons has a set of licenses that will help you dedicate your, you know, to, to share your works with others, to borrow other people's works, or dedicate your works to the public domain. So we're working with Creative Commons licenses right now in about 50 country, uh, countries, and I'll give you an idea about ways that you can share your property. Become familiar with the various levels of Creative Commons licenses. And this is something that will help you develop new content with text, images, multimedia, and, and let other people, uh, you know, and with other people who are happy to share content. So you can share other people's content, and you can share yours, and you can set the terms and conditions attached to the content you're willing to share. You can share it with a, with a license called Attribution, where you can let other people uh, copy your work, distribute it, display it, perform it if, it, if it's you know if it's music or or, uh, or a play or whatever. But you can let other people copy and distribute it, uh, and say, okay, you may copy my work, you may copy my blog post, you may copy my pictures, but only if you give a link black back to my blog and give me credit. That can be the uh, the terms and conditions that you assign to it. Uh, some people will issue a Creative Commons license for non-commercial use. And they say that you can have this. Sometimes they will give a free version of something for non-commercial use, uh, and 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 have you charge for commercial. A, you know, a good example of that is software. You see a lot of software that's free or less expensive for um, for personal use. The the Akismet spam filter for WordPress, for example, is free if you're using it on your personal blog. But if you're going to use it on a business blog, there is a charge attached to it. And if you're going to use it on multiple blogs, the price increases. So the license changes based upon commerciality. Um, you can also say that you can let people copy and distribute your work, but only if they leave it as is and if they don't change it and if they don't derive other, other works based upon it. So you can specify that very, very clearly and carefully. Um, you can also give other people the right to share as long as they make it clear that they're sharing with the same license that you're sharing with them. So uh, if you're, you know, if you're sharing a non-commercial use of one of your uh, pictures, let's say, maybe it's a family picture or something, and you will only let uh, people share it non-commercially, then, then they can share it, and then that, that license for non-commercial use of that photo stays with the photo um, if other people share it also. So that's Creative Commons, and that's definitely a really, really neat, neat turn of events that uh, that happened. That makes it a whole lot easier to give people choice, and uh, and uh, quite quite neat uh, on on both sides. Thou shalt not swipe thy neighbor's photos, and and that's that's really really neat. And 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 one of the best ways for for looking for photos and finding some photos where you don't have to pay a whole lot of money or any money in many cases is just by going over to Flickr. Um, it's a great website where you can actually uh, share your content, find others who are willing to share, and you can search for photos there using the licensing parameters to find the images for your, for your blog. Uh, sometimes you can find great photos and the only thing you need to, to comply with the Creative Commons licensing is place a link to the attribution with attribution to the photographer. Uh, you can see this kind of attribution regularly. I see it over at Inman News, and uh, Inman News editors frequently use photographs with Creative Commons attribution licensing in its news and feature stories. Pretty cool stuff. Inman is cutting edge with a lot, a lot of things. Okay, uh, and like we said before, thou shalt not steal maps, and uh, thou shalt really not steal <laughs> maps from from Len Harley in Maryland, in Virginia. Um, Len Harley is a highly regarded realtor who has beautiful maps on her website. She had the maps made for her website and for years real estate agents have borrowed her maps without permission. Len has, has, uh, has, has sent demand letters, sued people and, you know, for tens of thousands of dollars. Uh, you know, people, uh, agents and brokers who thought it was okay to copy her maps and use them on their own website. Uh, Len typically has a no prisoners attitude 
when it comes to her maps, and uh, and she is quite a uh, quite a quite a lady, quite a lady. She's been in online community for years, a very very vocal voice and a wonderful lady. Um, this map here, Google Map, is a good example of what you're not allowed to do with Google Maps. You see how the the name is on there, and it became an image. This is something that I made. And a couple of years ago, I wrote several tutorials about creative use of Google Maps using derivatives of the maps. Well, you know, one day somebody sent me a very polite email following one of my blog posts and, and sent me over to Google's Terms of Service, and I was shocked. I was shocked and embarrassed that I was sharing poor information, and I was equally shocked that only one person pointed it out. So if you do anything with Google Maps on your website or your blog, I urge you to read the Terms of Service attached to Google Maps. That's very important. You don't want to tangle with Google. Um, in fact, it's a good rule of thumb to read the terms of service attached to any product or service you use, whether it's a paid service or a free service. And be aware that the terms of service and, uh, and, and that you need to stay on top of, ch you know, they, they change. Terms of service change and you need to stay on top of changes to stay out of trouble. Good idea to keep up on things. Now, stock photography okay, is a collection or archive of images that can be licensed for use. And it's a way for companies or individuals to purchase photographs without having to hire a photographer for a special shoot. I, I like to use iStock and I use Dreamstime. Those are two of the services I use to purchase photos. If I'm doing a project, let's say when I did my HUD Homes online project, I went to Dreamstime and I purchased all of my photos at Dreamstime or, or I made some myself. And, uh, and it's easy for me to keep track of it that way. Now, there's another company, Getty Images, and that's a huge company, and it has hired attorneys to collect fees from people that are using their images without paying a fee. Um, copyright law grants registered copyright owners the right to recover, now dig this, copyright owners can recover at least $750 for each infringement reproduction. If you borrow or use, I'm saying we're using the word borrow, if you infringe with 10 photos on your website, 10 times 750 is $7,500. Those are That's a statutory uh, fine and, and they can get that. Now the law also recognizes that some people innocently infringe because they don't know better. Um, and if the infringer goes to court and proves that the infringement was innocent, the, the amount for the damages drops to 200. Now, I think that it probably is going to cost a lot more than $550 to go to court to argue and then have to pay another $200 for each, each uh, incident. So that can be a very, very expensive proposition. Now, uh, what, what, get, what these getting attorneys are doing, okay, they're not filing lawsuits. I mean, they can, they can file lawsuits, but they're not doing that. What they're doing is they're sending settlement demand letters to the infringers. And a lot of these infringers are real estate agents and brokers right now who are using templated websites. Okay, These agents and brokers did not go out and find the photos on Google and put them on their websites. Uh, there's a lot of gnashing in teeth around the industry right now and a lot of people are making payments to get it for damages You know, because it's just easier to pay a couple of hundred dollars to settle a claim than it is to get into a protracted legal dispute. So, this whole issue with Getty and uh, and damages is something uh, you know. Hopefully, that you're not going to have to deal with. But a lot of people are. It's been going on for a couple of years, and I don't think that I see it letting up a whole lot. Uh, go over and see the comments. I'll, again, there'll be a link to this in our in your handout. Uh, you'll be receiving a link to the handout after after the webinar. The comments is a very very neat little corner of Flickr where there are wonderful images you can use without worry because they are in the public domain. Um, I'm going to be doing a webinar soon for No Blogger Left Behind and, and if you register there you'll have access to some very, very rich information. Uh, that's way beyond the scope of today's webinar but keep your eyes open because that's coming very soon. Um, I recently discovered how to quickly determine um, if, if, government, if a government document is in the public domain and then how to use some innovative search strategies to find those documents. It's, this, is, this is one of the little secrets um, information marketers use to produce products. And, and you can use the same strategies to build some rich content in your blog. Um, in the meantime, go over to the, to the commons and, uh, and see if there are some pictures of, your, you know, of, of special places in your market area that you can use on your blog because that's very, very neat and, and very, very rich and just really, really neat spot. Now the bottom line is this. 
if you publish somebody else's content on your blog, you need permission to publish it. Sometimes that permission is granted when, when you pay a fee, and sometimes there are other terms attached to the permissions. And be sure that you document your permission each and every time you use property that somebody else has created. Keep a paper trail or keep a, you know, keep a digital trail, keep some sort of a trail of documentation each time you use somebody else's material. And, uh, and, and again, we're coming down here now, number nine, you've got to be really, really careful using video. Now remember, as, as I said earlier, um, you don't have to do something wrong to get in trouble. And, and that's one of the things that's happening with video these days. YouTube is sending some notes to people uh, who are using music when the music matches copyrighted files in, in the YouTube index. Now there are two sites in particular where there are some discussions over at Facebook in the last couple of weeks between real estate agents who are getting warning letters from YouTube. Some of those agents are using Animoto videos. Um, Animoto, of course, is a video uh, video creation uh, portal, and some are using real estate shows, which is a you know kind of a, a, a virtual tour type of company. Now both of these are real estate marketing tools and both offer musical backgrounds as part of their service. Now management at both of these sites, ha I'm sure, have, have, have legitimate uh, licenses. They know what they're doing. I, I know both of them, you know, I've met them. Um, and they have the right to share the music. But for the time being, those appeals to YouTube uh, seem to be falling on deaf ears. So I've heard agents decide to stop using the musical backgrounds at Animoto and real estate shows to avoid having their video shut down or even worse, seeing their YouTube accounts canceled altogether. You know, people have a lot of work in their YouTube accounts and it would be a shame to see all of those videos shut down and to lose an account. Uh, you know, I, I think it's also a great time to look at some YouTube options uh, and uh, you know, I think Welcome Mat has a great video solution for real estate agents and if you haven't looked at that, I think it would be a good idea to keep your options open and see what type of stuff they're doing at Welcome Mat that can support you with your videos. Okay, number 10, don't ignore lawsuits. You know, just don't ignore things uh, because it's, it's, it's not smart. You know, nobody wants to be sued. It happens a lot though and it doesn't have to happen every single time. Um, you know, look at it this way. Before you get behind the wheel of a car, you turn on the ignition, hit the road, you have a license to drive. You take a test, you know the rules of the road and the highways and the buyers have a higher standard of, of, of safety attached to driving. When you are creating content for the web, or printed, you're wise to know the rules of the road relative to intellectual property rights. Otherwise, you may end up defending yourself in court or writing checks for hundreds of thousands of dollars. Don't ignore letters from attorneys. Don't ignore letters to cease and desist. And by all means, don't ignore you know lawsuit uh, notices, because if you do, you can get into trouble. And 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 it doesn't have to happen. You know, it can be very very expensive. And it's really not uh, not a good idea. It costs everybody a lot of money and a lot of aggravation. Lawsuits are no fun at all. Well, thank you for joining me today. Uh, you will be see, receive a follow-up email that will contain a link to the handout. Um, if you are not at No Blogger Left Behind, I hope you will consider joining us. We're, we've got some cutting-edge stuff over there.